Judy Smith was born in 1946 in Hyannis, Massachusetts. She had an ordinary childhood for the most part, and got married right after high school. But shortly after her marriage, Judy's husband decided to flee to Sweden, in an attempt to avoid the draft for the war. She went after her new husband to find him and convince him to come back with her, but her efforts were in vain. Judy returned to the US empty-handed. Distraught and helpless, she filed for divorce. A few years later, Judy met Charles Bradford, who worked in the racehorse industry. They fell in love and got married. They even went on to have two children together, Craig and Amy. But Judy's newfound happiness would not last for long as her marriage slowly started to fall apart and before long, she was once again separated from her husband. Judy was now an unemployed single mother struggling to take care of her children. But Judy did not despair, she found a day job and even enrolled herself in nursing school. She spent a lot of her free time studying and that paid off well, as she became a successful home health care nurse. She had been through a lot in her life but her hard work finally started to bear fruit. At the age of 40, in 1986, Judy was a home care nurse in the Boston area, tending to an old man who was recovering from a recent throat surgery. It was through this job that she met Jeffrey Smith, the son of the ailing patient that Judy was caring for. Jeffrey was impressed by Judy's work ethic, and was also grateful to her for taking such good care of his father. Jeffrey was a well-to-do lawyer but had many things in common with Judy, both were divorced single parents and both enjoyed a lot of the same things. Judy seemed to have finally found someone who truly made her happy. The two began dating and were together for seven years, before finally getting married in November of 1996. The couple were known to have had a normal relationship. Jeffrey had to travel a lot for his work, and Judy liked to travel alone. She was an independent woman who enjoyed her freedom, having lived most of her adult life taking care of things on her own. Judy had been to Europe on her own a few times, and when her children were pre-teens, she took them along to Europe for a backpacking adventure. Judy also traveled solo to Thailand, where she went hiking and visited friends. While Judy wasn't exactly fit, she was an active person who enjoyed walking, hiking, and sightseeing. She was also known to be a devoted nurse, who once helped an AIDS patient who was having a medical crisis on a plane. So while Judy was kind-hearted and considerate, she wasn't thought to be naive, and was able to take care of herself in a variety of different situations. A few months into their marriage, Jeffrey was planning his work trip to a conference in Philadelphia that was taking place from April 9th to 11th, at the Doubletree Hotel. Jeffrey suggested that Judy come along with him so they can also have a small trip together. Judy agreed to go with him and decided to do some sightseeing while Jeffrey was busy with his conference. They both planned to meet some friends in New Jersey after the conference was done. On the morning of April 9, 1997, the couple headed to Logan International Airport, to check in for their flight to Philadelphia. But once at the airport, Judy realized that she did not have her photo ID on her, without which she would not be allowed to board the plane. So, Judy convinced Jeffrey to go ahead without her and that she would catch the next flight later that day. That evening, Judy met up with her husband in the lobby of the Doubletree Hotel. She apologized to him for her forgetfulness and gave him some flowers. The next morning, while Judy was still asleep, Jeffrey went down to have the complimentary breakfast at the hotel restaurant. He returned to their room to find his wife in the shower. They spent some time together and discussed their plans for the day. Judy planned to take the Philadelphia Flash Bus to see some famous places such as the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. They both decided to meet up at the hotel in the evening to go to a cocktail party at 6 p.m. Judy left for the day dressed quite modestly in a dark coat, blue jeans and white tennis shoes, carrying a bright red backpack. After finishing up with his moderating sessions at the conference, Jeffrey returned to their room hoping to find Judy waiting for him. But she had not returned from his sightseeing. He figured she might have already freshened up and gone to the cocktail party ahead of time. But after he went downstairs to check, he did not find Judy anywhere in the hotel. He went back and forth between their room and the lobby but had no luck finding her. He grew concerned and informed the concierge that his wife was missing, who promptly started to make calls to local hospitals at around 6.15 pm. 
At 6.30 p.m., Jeffrey hopped in a taxi, and instructed the driver to take the flash bus route slowly, so he could look for his wife. He called his stepchildren in Boston and asked one of them to go to their house, and check their answering machines for any messages. They had no luck with this either. With no signs of Judy, Jeffrey called the police to report his wife missing. Shockingly, the PPD told Jeffrey that he couldn't file a report until it had been 24 hours since the last final sighting of Judy. But after lodging some complaints with some high-ranking officials within the city, a missing persons report was taken for Judy Smith on the morning of April 11, 1997. Right from the start, the PPD seemed reluctant to take up the missing person case of Judy Smith. From their initial nonchalance attitude to filing a report, to later claiming that Judy just had a midlife crisis and was doing this for attention, the overall approach of the PPD towards the case was questionable at best. Despite these setbacks, the police had begun their investigation. They interviewed Jeffrey, Judy's children, and others in order to retrace Judy's last steps. They concluded that Judy had taken her signature red backpack, her wallet, the jewelry she normally wore including a diamond engagement band and a simple silver wedding ring, and the clothes on her back. Jeffrey estimated that she had approximately $200 with her at the time. Judy left behind her passport at her home in Massachusetts, meaning she could not have easily left the county. The Smith's two landline records were checked, but nothing out of the ordinary was found. After their initial investigation, the PPD began to doubt that Judy had ever come to Philadelphia in the first place. They claimed that it's odd that someone like Judy, who was a seasoned traveler, would forget something as important as a photo ID before traveling. Later investigation showed that someone named Judith Smith did indeed take a 7.30 p.m. flight into Philadelphia, and the flight manifest showed that the ticket was used to make the flight that evening. The police also claimed that it was odd that Judy did not carry any cosmetics with her. They also found clothes that were worn for two days in a row. But Judy's children did not find this out of the ordinary, as they stated that their mother wasn't particular about wearing makeup, and she would often wear the same clothes for more than a day at a time. The PPD went on to say that no one other than Jeffrey could definitively say that Judy was in Philadelphia. This prompted a few witnesses to come forward and give their statements about seeing Judy in the hotel. This included a receptionist, a concierge and a conference attendee named Carmen Catazon. All the witness statements seemed to line up with Jeffrey's account of events. The PPD's tirade against Jeffrey did not end there as they revealed that he was not fully cooperative with their investigation. They said that he would not submit himself to a polygraph. Jeffrey denied this accusation and claimed that he was willing to take the lie detector test as long as it was given by an outside agency such as the FBI. The PPD asserted that even after certain conditions were met, Jeffrey refused to take the test. In the days after Judy's disappearance, local media ran stories about the case. Jeffrey, along with his stepchildren and some family members, put up missing person flyers with her picture and information. This led to multiple reports of sightings by different people, some of which were credible according to Jeffrey. A hotel employee recalled having met Judy on the morning of April 10th when she inquired about the flash bus stop. And one of the flash bus drivers said he had picked her up at front and south streets early in the afternoon, and may have let her off near the hotel. She was also reportedly seen entering and leaving the city's Greyhound bus terminal, possibly to use the bathroom, her family believes. The terminal is near Philadelphia's Chinatown, and since Judy loved Chinese and Thai food, she might have gone there to eat. However, no one at any of the restaurants recalled her. Many sightings were reported over the next few days, in an area called Penn's Landing. Witnesses claimed to have seen a disoriented woman walking around nearby. It was later discovered that most of these sightings were actually of a local homeless woman who bore striking resemblance to Judy. At one point while searching the area, even Judy's son Craig had mistaken the homeless woman for his mother. This doppelganger was stopped by the police and volunteers multiple times, who had confused her for Judy. Even so, there were other witnesses who reported seeing a woman matching Judy's profile. A homeless man named David, who lived near the Doubletree Hotel, claimed to have seen Judy on the night of April 10th in the Penn's Landing area. He insisted that the woman he saw was Judy and not the other homeless woman from the neighborhood. 
and on April 11, a salesperson and a customer of Macy's in Deptford Mall in New Jersey claimed to have seen Judy trying to shop for dresses for her daughter. They even recognized the bright red backpack that Judy was last seen wearing. They described her as a bit odd as she seemed a little distracted and lost. A second story ran in the local newspaper on April 14 about Judy's case. This prompted more witnesses to come forward with their accounts. And one of the most noteworthy accounts was that of a Society Hill Hotel employee, who explained that a woman who matched Judy's description stayed in the hotel from April 13 to 15. This woman was described as extremely weird, as she was seen touching herself in the open, speaking in tongues and loudly exclaiming that the emperor would wire her money so she could stay longer. A statement made by a nearby Best Western Hotel employee was eerily similar to the story described by the Society Hill Hotel employee. This led the investigators to believe that a strange woman had indeed checked into these hotels, but could not verify if it was actually Judy. After a few weeks of Judy's disappearance, Jeffrey decided to hire private investigators to help him in his search for her. He faxed and mailed copies of Judy's missing person flyer to them, who in turn sent it out to hospitals all over the country. Jeffrey even ended up on the popular TV series, Unsolved Mysteries, in hopes of improving their chances of finding Judy. On September 7, 1997, a father and son who were hunting for deer on a hillside area in North Carolina's Pisgah National Forest, near Asheville, found what appeared to be human bones scattered around a shallow grave, mostly due to scavenging animals. Most of the bones still remained in the grave, and the skeleton was partially clothed. They found some personal effects nearby the bones. The state medical examiner of Asheville determined that the bones were of a white woman, aged between 40 to 50 years, who had an arthritic left knee. They also found cuts and punctures on her clothing, which seemed to suggest that the woman was stabbed. This helped them conclude that this was a case of homicide. An emergency room physician in Franklin, North Carolina, after reading an article about the discovery of the human remains, recalled seeing the missing person flyer of Judy and made the connection. Armed with new clues, the police asked Jeffrey for the dental records of Judy, which were then sent to the medical examiner in Asheville. The dental records matched that of the deceased woman, and by the end of September, the remains were identified as those of Judy Smith. The strange thing about the personal effects found near the bones was that some of them clearly belonged to Judy, like the diamond engagement band with a pear-shaped stone and the wedding ring which had been found nearby, and some of them did not belong to Judy. The shirt buried nearby was a men's shirt and was believed to belong to the killer, not Judy. Furthermore, the sunglasses found nearby did not appear to be Judy's as Judy's kids said she wasn't the type to spend over $100 on sunglasses. No wallet or other identification was found in her pockets. After an identification of the remains was made, Buncombe County Sheriff's Department took over the case from the PPD. Several residents of Asheville had come forward to report seeing or interacting with Judy in April, right around the time of her disappearance in Philadelphia. Some of these reports were taken to be credible by the Buncombe PD. In an effort to retrace Judy's steps, the Buncombe investigators flew to Philadelphia just to make sure that all the statements made by Jeffrey and his stepchildren matched up. They determined that Judy had briefly stayed in the Double Tree Hotel before traveling to Pisgah National Forest. They revealed that there is no indication that Judy had been abducted or that she was forced to travel. They believed that Judy made the journey on her own. The Buncombe PD quickly ruled out Jeffrey as a suspect as he was a morbidly obese man who had trouble climbing stairs or even simply walking. They believed that it would be impossible for Jeffrey to have disposed of Judy's body in the forest, especially since the area where her remains were found was exceptionally steep, and one would have had to hike up and down that incline. His presence at the conference was also corroborated by witnesses. The Philadelphia PD however, never did rule him out as a suspect, as they believed that Jeffrey might have had an accomplice to carry out the crime. This also is unlikely as phone records and financial statements show nothing out of the ordinary, and Jeffrey was genuinely trusted by his family, including his stepchildren. One of Jeffrey and Judy's friends, Carolyn Dickey who appeared on the show Unsolved Mysteries, claimed that the Smith's marriage was very tenuous, at the time that Judy disappeared. She believes that something happened that triggered Judy to want to disappear, 
which led her to Asheville where she met with foul play at the hands of a killer. Although, Judy's children and other family members did not say that they noticed any problems in her marriage, which would make her want to disappear and abandon her family. Another theory is that a serial killer named Gary Michael Hilton, sometimes called the National Park Killer, was responsible. In 2008, Hilton was arrested for murder in a national park and was later linked to three other murders, all of which took place between 2005 and 2008. He is considered a suspect in many other cases of murder from across the country. Hilton was in his 60s at the time he committed the crimes, and he would often rob his victims. One of the most convincing pieces of evidence that ties Hilton to Judy's murder is that he dumped the body of one of his victims in the same area where Judy's remains were discovered. But of course, this is still conjecture as there are things that don't add up, like the fact that Judy was not robbed and that her murder took place 10 years before any of Hilton's other murders. Some have speculated that Judy was tricked into going to North Carolina. Perhaps she met someone while sightseeing who offered her a ride and that person abducted her or drove her to North Carolina for some reason. Amnesia is one possible explanation for Judy's disappearance. The family believes that Judy might have been injured or otherwise suffered a bout of dissociative amnesia, which caused her to become confused or forget her identity. This is supported by the sightings of a confused or disoriented Judy in Philadelphia. The family believes this explains why Judy traveled to the Pisgah National Forest apparently of her own free will. Another theory is that the body that was found in Pisgah National Forest was not Judy at all, and that the remains were misidentified. Those who make this claim usually back it up by pointing to the medical examiner's report that the woman's remains had been in the forest for over a year, while Judy had only been missing for five months at the time of the discovery. Whatever the truth is, the mystery behind Judy's disappearance and death is baffling and profoundly sad. But at least, Judy's family can find closure in knowing that she received a proper farewell. What do you think happened to Judy? Do you believe any of the theories supposed by online sleuths? Thank you for watching and we hope you found our video interesting. Like, comment and subscribe for more fascinating unsolved mysteries.